Hey guys, welcome to the Massive Iron Podcast. The Massive Iron Podcast today. Today I have the bald Omni Man, Paris. Paris, how you doing? What's up, y'all? How you doing? Good. Uh, uh, you know, I got to tell you, man. Um, before we, b- well, before I tell my little story, uh, tell everybody where they can find you on the YouTube's and on Instagram. So on YouTube, it's bald Omni Man. You'll know me when you see me because it'll be the uh, the meme picture of Omni Man laying in a hospital bed and he's bald. Same thing on Instagram. So I'm most active on Instagram, I would say, in terms of like responding to messages. I respond to comments, too, but it's just a lot easier on Instagram for me to do that. So on uh, YouTube, I know you as a bald Omni Man, but in real life, you have a name called Paris Butler. Um, so, man, I... I I want to tell you a little bit of a story, and then I don't want to ask you some questions about YouTube. Uh, before I get into things, for anybody that doesn't know you, um, I kind of know you as like this guy that's just rocketing up out of nowhere on YouTube. And I always enjoy connecting with folks like that because, you know, I'm, I'm an old man. I've been doing YouTube forever, and I've seen all the old guard come and go. And, uh, you know, I've seen you basically in the last year, you know, rocket up. And I was looking at your YouTube channel actually before we went on, and I'm surprised your subscriber level is only twenty thousand based on the size of some of your videos. Do you do you recall when you uh, hit ten thousand subscribers? I hit ten thousand. I think it was either last month or about a month and a half ago. So I'm about at twenty one thousand. I think now. Last I checked. So moving pretty quickly. Now I will tell you. Um, I recall, I seem to recall you commenting on some of my videos way back in the day. And I don't, I I didn't know who you were at all. I think a couple of times I might've told you to go clean your room or something. I might've been a smart (laughs) I I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I think I, I think I told the bald Omni man to go clean his room or something, something uh, way back when. So I'm like, I hope he, hope he doesn't hold a grudge against me. I didn't even know who you were at the time, but um, I heard your uh, podcast with uh, Alex Bromley, and you were talking about how you spent a lot of time uh, commenting on others, uh, other people's channels. Tell us a little bit about that. Man, so first and foremost, with the because uh, I'll, I'll tell the story behind that interaction. I thought it was an honor to have the big, hairy, ugly dude tell me to go clean my fucking room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Thanks, I, didn't, I didn't take it any kind of way. That's good. I think I was actually talking to uh, Dennis Arnold, Freaky D, on his Instagram. I think that's where this conversation happened. And we were talking about his overhead press. Um, and I was like, man, he told me to go clean my room. I'm, I'm, I, made, I made it, you know. So <laughs> Right, right. So first and foremost, it was hilarious for me. In terms of the YouTube commenting grind, though, that's exactly what it is. So for those that aren't aware, for you to start to get recommended, on like the YouTube algorithm, you have to have at least a thousand subs. So my thing was, is like, I'm already watching all these YouTube channels. I've been watching your channel since forever, quite honestly. I'm gonna leave comments on them. They're gonna be either related to the video or just something funny related to the video. And I'm gonna do it first before everybody so that people can see my profile, see my profile picture, click on it, see something they like and then subscribe. I always tried to offer value and not just give like mindless sycophantic comments like I see because there's a bunch of channels that do the same thing. That's just their strategy. It's very common. But like I said, I tried to avoid being sycophantic because to me, when I saw comments like that, the last thing I wanted to do was click on that dude's channel. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. There was actually a post. Um, like I've been doing content development forever. You know, I, that's what I did for a living uh, with muscle and strength and Tiger Fitness. And um, there's actually a strategy. And I saw a post come by yesterday where somebody was talking about how to grow your channel, how to grow your Instagram. It was by commenting on other people's stuff, but not just leaving, you know, like bullshit comments, you know, actually contributing to the discussion. Absolutely. You have to contribute to the culture to become a part of it. You can't just be like a uh, a fanboy. You can't be a spectator. You have to offer something. So that's what I would always try to do, offer something to the conversation. So let's backtrack a little bit. Do you recall when you hit a thousand subscribers? Because for those that are uh, listening, that's kind of the magic level where you can 
start to monetize and actually feel kind of legit? I think I hit a thousand subs five months ago. So, I mean, I haven't been on YouTube for very long. It's only been, this would be my first year on YouTube. So, I mean, I saw in my eyes a pretty quick growth, but to me, looking at my YouTube studio every day, I felt some days like my subs weren't going up at all. And so you look at your analytics and you're like, okay, I gained this many this month. So I am growing. Um, my advice to anybody that's kind of on that YouTube grind is to not look at your YouTube studio every day. Cause I did it and I felt for a while I wasn't going anywhere until I just looked at like the monthly analytics instead of looking at the shit daily. Yeah. 100%. I mean, I'm coming in on my 12th year and I haven't hit a hundred thousand subscribers yet. You probably hit it before I will. Um, we'll see though, but you know how, how um, you've been doing YouTube just about a year looking at your videos and uh, you're probably on a, you know, I wouldn't doubt it to see you hit a hundred thousand super quick. Um, and I love Jeffrey Verity Schofield. You know, he's one of my favorite guys. And, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised with how fast your, your channel has grown, how fast your views are. If you wouldn't hit a hundred thousand before he would, I'm not sure where he's at, but how's that changed for you? I mean, you know how it is when you get like, you know, six, 700 views and you get a couple comments. What are the comments section now on your channel? What does that look like? So one thing I'll say is that I've always been really big with my platform, with building a sense of community and like a positive environment for people to interact with one another. So it's more or less been that, but on a larger scale, the more subs I get. So I, I call everybody Chad or handsome or big guy or something like that. And I really mean it because I want people to feel good about themselves. So it's just been more of that, but on a larger scale, I would say. Now, um, we've never talked before this, so I just want to let everybody know we I know absolutely nothing about you and your background. What's your age, if you don't mind me asking? 27. So you're 27. Take us back. When did you when do you recall first training seriously? First training seriously. I told the um the story on Bromley's podcast, but for those that haven't watched that, first and foremost, watch it. It was an epic conversation. I remember like it being gym class when I'm like a teenager. Meanwhile, I'm like a larger kid. I'm like honestly morbidly obese, but I always had a sense of self-confidence. I didn't carry myself like I was morbidly obese. I didn't know any better to not do that. So in gym class, we had like a yearly physical fitness test. It was like a mile run, push-ups, and a few other things. Seeing how bad I did objectively compared to everybody else, even like the, the girls honestly told me like, man, like, I can do better. It's time to use this weight set that my cousin donated to me. And the next time I take this test, I'm not going to get mogged by everybody like that. So that summer, I um, trained really hard, I'd say, cleaned up my diet. And I'd say about over the course of the next year or two, I lost a ton of weight. And, you know, when it was time for me to take not, not the next test, but, you know, it'd be the test after I did a lot better. I didn't get mogged by everybody. For me, my biggest goal at that point was, well, when you're a kid, if you can do 50 push-ups, you're a stud. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do 50, I'm going to do 50 push-ups. And then I got to 80 and so on. So I talked a lot about uh, ascending your goals over time and keeping them open-ended so that you can keep your interest fresh on Bromley's channel. That's been my just approach in general with my training. So I'll set so many goals every year for this year. It was overhead press is one. I'll probably get to that in the latter section of the year, but I'm working on front squats right now. Um, and then when I reach a certain threshold on front squats, I'll just move laterally to some other leg exercise. And that's how I keep things interesting for me because I've been training for a while. So what, uh, what you, how old were you when you really felt like you hit a groove with your training and really started to understand what it would take to build muscle? Trial and error. So I'd say 23, you know, 23 after tasting and touching a lot of different methodologies, listening to a ton of different content, trying a ton of different things. I found for me, 
you know, and I've evolved since then in terms of my knowledge and things like that. But I found for me a, a group of exercises and a way of doing things that worked really well. I've seen my most explosive growth in the past, I would say, honestly, like a couple years than in the entire maybe like 10 years prior to that. And that just comes with experience. A lot of people, and I don't know what your opinion on this is, but a lot of people seem to think that like you can train for a few years and then just by virtue of you training hard for a few years, you're going to gain 80% of your gains. My counter to that is, is that in a perfect world where you know everything and you're going to do it optimally from the very beginning, I don't even think it'd be possible for you to do that. Certainly not with a lot the way a lot of people do it, where they do a lot of shit wrong. They're not bulking a lot of the time, you know, so. Yeah, you know, you, I mean, like you really have to have everything in line for that to occur. You know, we talk a lot about beginner gains, but, you know, in, in this day and age, there's so much information. You really would need to have somebody like on your shoulder telling you specifically everything to do. I was lucky because for me, all my pieces fell into place. I went off to college. I was a poor kid. Um, all of a sudden, I could eat all I wanted. And man, I was eating all I wanted, right? You know, and I was training. I could sleep in. So I had the sleep going. I had the food going. And I, basically, I was in a small gym where nobody else went to. So it was like my gym, man. I'm like, man, I'm going to get after it. So for me... I kind of stumbled into dumb luck. You know, I ate like a ton. I lifted hard. I stumbled into progressive overload and I stumbled into sleep. But I think you're right. You know, for the average person, it's more about getting up to speed and understanding what it's going to take to actually build muscle so you can finally start running. Absolutely. And just to like summarize what I've come to know to be true, there's a few different things you have to do. Like you said, you got to eat. You gotta sleep and you and top of that have to know a few simple progression models that you can repeat over and over and over and over again over time i think that last part is where people kind of get lost in the minutia of things and major in the minors and then get caught up in you know trying things with you know, not even really giving it the time it needs to see if it works for them so in other words they're program hopping all the time so I want to ask you, um, you said you lost weight. Do you remember what you were at your heaviest? It's embarrassing. I almost don't want to say it. Uh, no, dude, camera. I was 340. <laughs> I was 346. So unless you lap me, you know, you got plenty of room. To, you got plenty of safety room here. Uh, not quite. So almost 300. So I got to ask you because it's curious. When I'm working with someone and they manage to lose a lot of weight, Sometimes when you talk about bulking, like common sense, real bulking, you know, sane bulking, they're afraid of gaining weight. Was that part of a, was that part of a mental struggle for you after you lost the weight? Honestly, no. So I'm always a person that in terms of like, you know, training and body composition and gaining or losing weight, I've always been very logical because I've always looked at it as like, you plug in certain numbers and this is the result that you're going to get. So like, if I eat this much, this is what will happen. If I eat this much, this is what will happen. So that being said, I was never a person where when I was really heavy, I, I felt bad about myself for being really heavy. I felt bad that I got mogged by a bunch of girls in gym class. I didn't give a fuck, right, that, right. I was, I didn't give a fuck that I was fat. You know what I mean? So for me, after I lost the weight, and as I, you know, kind of got out of that phase where I couldn't just get stronger just by maintaining or not really paying attention to what I'm eating. Naturally, through me perusing the Internet, I saw that, like, you got to gain weight to get bigger. It just makes sense. I just needed, in my mind, to make it sense, make it make sense logically. So that's where the whole lean bulking thing came into play. And from there, it was just like, OK, I accept that I'm going to gain weight. And because I am training a little a lot of it's going to be muscle. I'm not going to get fat by lifting weights. It's not how it works unless I eat way too much. So let's talk about your nutrition approach because everybody watching wants to look like you. They they want to fast forward two or three years and be in the position you're at. And you're kind of like 
it's hard for people to see because they just see the big hairy old motherfucker in front of them right but like you're where i was like year three or four you know like body clones and that's kind of like where everybody would like to be and i just express you know i just explained how i got there but when nutrition wise were you counting macros were you tracking calories were you just in a uh, a surplus did you do bulks and then mini cuts how did you approach everything so for me i can talk about when i was really heavy and then what i've transitioned into over time when i was really heavy that was just as a consequence of honestly eating when i was bored that'd be the biggest thing that's very relatable to a lot of people a lot of people don't eat when they're hungry they eat when they're bored and i would eat like a lot just because I, that's just what you did. You didn't waste food. So you ate the food till it was gone. I transitioned away first from eating when I was bored and then transitioned away from eating like junk food and drinking sugary drinks. And that alone, honestly, I was probably eating over 6,000, 7,000 calories a day. It, it slashed that to like a more reasonable level. Um, now, in terms of what I do nowadays, I eat around 3,500 calories a day. I'm bulking right now. When I'm cutting, something that I always tell people is, is that, in my opinion, I don't know how you feel about this or we could talk about it, but in my opinion, when you cut, it makes most sense to me to cut so that you have room to then bulk again. So for right. me, I like, I like cutting as quickly as possible. The way I tell people to do that is, is not necessarily to just slash your calories by an arbitrary number. But be comfortable with like, quote unquote, progressively overloading your deficit to the point, you know, where you still have mental acuity. You're not always thinking about food and you're not your your strength numbers aren't tanking too much. So but anyway, in terms of my specific dietary approach now, like I said, I eat around thirty five hundred calories. It's all home cooked food for the most part. Um, veggies with every meal. Hydration is really important to me. So not only drinking water, but making sure I'm getting enough salt, potassium, drinking coconut water. I like to keep, keep things simple because um, what you can't track, you can't manage. And you can't really track shit if you're making extravagant meals or eating out all the damn time. So, like, I made a video the other day where I said I felt like once you figured things out, it's really not complicated. You just kind of get in your groove with sleep and food and lifting and – all the other stuff that people focus on out there in the lifting world, that's like their 90% where to you, it's like your 10%. You're in your groove with food. You got everything nailed as far as calories and sleep and training, and you're just going along and you see these other people worrying about all this other stuff while you're just right in your tunnel. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And when you're in the zone and when you're in your groove like that, it does become super simple. That would be my biggest piece of advice to people. So find something that really like works for you, a group of meals that taste good and just like quote unquote program variations of those meals and just eat them over and over again. It doesn't mean eat the same shit every day, but right. keep it simple so that you can mindlessly like, okay, I'm going to eat this and do this in the gym and progress this way. And then that way you think less about it and you're less emotionally attached to the results of it because you're doing something that you know works at the end of the day. Yeah, you need some form of structure. And if you don't, like, you can't wake up every day and expect to look like uh, like you and just say, I, I don't know what I'm going to eat for dinner. I'm not sure what I'm going to eat for lunch. There has to be some structure in there, right? Absolutely. So structure is key, as you said. You know, and that could just be as simple as with every meal, I'm going to have half my plate with vegetables on it. There you go. There's your structure. You can vary your protein sources or whatever carbs you're going to eat. But for the most part, you're always going to make sure that you're eating something that has uh, food volume to it. It's going to fill you up. It's going to have lots of micronutrients. And because you're eating lots of micronutrients, you're going to be able to properly absorb all the protein and carbs that you're eating. So just as simple as that. Now, you mentioned cutting to make room for bulking. Um, I got a bulking uh, PDF that I have out, and it basically basically the same thing. So I think we agree. Um, what I try to have guys do is after they bulk, they cut the amount of weight they bulk, and that's assuming you know they're at a 
a body weight where like say you got a dude that's 200 pounds mm-hmm. he might have bulked eight pounds to get to 200 then he would cut i'd have him cut like eight to ten so he can make room to kind of accordion back and forth stay in his weight zone and kind of slowly change his body composition over time so i kind of understand what you mean that's super interesting so i think that's more or less what i do intuitively so i can talk about myself a little bit every time i bulk I cut to like a specific body weight and every time I end up a little bit leaner and a little bit more muscular at that body weight. So usually I'll bulk to about, you know, 200 or 205 or so. I'm five foot 11 for those that, you know, want to extrapolate that. Um, And then I cut down to like 163, 165. And every time I do that, I'm a little bit more muscular, like five or six pounds more muscular, I would say. Right. Now I want to um I want to jump over uh I want to talk about weight fear a little bit. I'll get in just a minute, but when you were younger, did you uh you know, younger guy, did you get involved in any of the supplement world, make any mistakes, toss any cash down the toilet or were you pretty much didn't really care, didn't have the money? <laughs> That's a funny story. So uh I would say this is right around after I lost a bunch of weight. I started wanting to, you know, get more serious about gaining muscle. Now that I had lost a lot of weight and kind of tapped out my potential with calisthenics at the time. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to buy some protein powder from GNC. I gave my dad some money to go buy it for me because at the time I was still um, living with my parents. I was still young. I was a kid. I'm a kid to you now, probably, but I was a little baby to you at the time. Right. Um, And I remember just the protein powder being so fucking gross. I didn't want to buy any of it after that. So I just ate food, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, back in my day, um, all we had was like the Weeder magazines, you know, Muscle and Fitness and Flex. And, you know, 90% of that stuff, uh, you know, was just absolute crap, even the protein powder. But, you know, I tried it all. I was a kid. You know, you got to try it all. Now, um I want to talk about weight fear and I want to get your thoughts on this. You get a guy, you get a lot of guys um, who will build up okay strength levels, right? They start out and they'll get their dumbbell bench to like fifties or 55s. And, you know, they'll get their squat to like 225 by five. And then you see a lot of guys kind of get this weight fear where the weight starts to feel heavy. And they almost start to slow down their attack. They don't attack as much. Like you got a progressive overload plan, but you see so many guys like the weight feels heavy. I got to deload, reload, unload. You don't, they kind of lose that attack. Um, When you got to that point in your training, uh, did you ever feel any weight fear or did you just roll on like a bulldozer? So I would say I definitely felt the weights getting heavier. I also understood that like, you know, that that shouldn't stop me from trying to progress my strength further. So just a perennial truth is if you bench, say, for example, 315 pounds and then you go from that to benching 500 pounds, 315 pounds is never not going to feel like 315 pounds sitting on your arms. It's still going to feel the same. Your muscles are just going to be able to move more easily. Same thing with squats, because that's one that people are really like psych themselves out about. It's not a lot of the times that you can't squat it. It just feels heavy on your back and you don't have the confidence to do so. A lot of weight, like hundreds of pounds is always going to feel like hundreds of pounds on your back. I think understanding that and just, again, thinking about it logically allowed me to further progress in my strength training. And I think if people did that as well, however they need to go about doing that, that would help them out, too. Do you think it takes almost a degree of recklessness or like, you know, um, like something genetic where you simply, you know, you you don't have as much fear or you don't care about the outcome? I think people like that are intuitively like the the high performers in the the weight room because they're typically like people that are more explosive and naturally strong anyway. Um, I do think that that's, that's a trait that you can develop over time as well. I think to a large extent, it's more about taking uh, calculated risks. So if you record yourself squatting 
10 less pounds in the weight than you're scared of and it moved fast. But more than likely, if you add 10 more pounds to that, it's going to move pretty fast as well. You're not going to not be able to do it. So in addition to like the mindset piece, I really do encourage everybody to record as much of their lifting as they can for a bunch of reasons, but that's one of them. Now you mentioned progressive overload. Um, what, what was your meat and potatoes approach when it came to progressive overload? One that I really liked or like now, quite honestly, is your rep goal system. That's really intuitive just to auto regulate progress. Um, another one would be like starting with like an RPE based top set and then doing percentage back downs off of whatever you hit on your top set. And then that's like auto regulated too. And then honestly, this is one that I just encourage everyone to try. My boy, Sam Sheether, uh, freakishly exotically strong individual. He's 23 years old and just pulled, uh, 880 sumo i think something like that and his brother uh is a phenom as well something that really he really enjoys and he put me on to was just the concept of beating the books i think that that that's something that everybody especially if you're a newer lifter you you should try at some point because it teaches you effort you have to understand what a maximal set feels like for you to just use the rep goal system and to use right. rpe and to do all these other things I think people put the cart before the horse when it comes to that. Far be it for me to say that you can just, you know, add a rep every time you do an exercise or add weight every time you do an exercise. But you should actively try to do that as a newer lifter safely, of course, for as long as you can until you hit that wall where you're like, OK, I maximally exerted myself on this set. I couldn't have done any more if someone put a gun to my head and made me. Right. So when you say beat the books, you're like beat what you did last time. Are you saying go in and just try to get your uh, your plus one over, at least a plus one over last time? Absolutely. So it's a plus one over last time in terms of the reps. You could do an extra set or you could add more weight. That's something that I like doing on like smaller accessory movements that you rotate around anyway. So you're able to do that long term. That's that's uh, exactly you know what I did in college. No one no one taught it to me and I'm not, you know, I wasn't exactly a wizard. I got pinned under nine, three reps on 95 on bench. And I'm like, man, I want to do four next time. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I'm going to do four next time, you know, cause like the four, the first time I went in the gym, I'm like, Hey, I can lift a 25 pound plate, right? I should be able to push this off my chest. No problem. So I put 25s on both sides. I hit the third rep, the fourth rep. I got pinned in a busy weight room felt like an idiot i'm like i'm never going back again <laughs> so the next time i went in i'm like i want the fourth rep i want the plus one and that's kind of how it began and yet you hit the nail on the head when you start to get into that style of training you start to push more sets to the limit and you start to understand what an rpe is you know and like you're right i believe people are putting the cart before the horse you need to kind of get in, get your form down as a beginner, and then start to work on maximizing sets a little bit before you start to get in all the complicated stuff. Absolutely. It's like, you know, like you said, the meat and potatoes has to come before you try different seasonings or add different shit to your plate. You have to understand how to make meat and potatoes. So let's talk about strength. And I want to talk about your programming and, and how you like to train. Um, but let's talk about strength. What are some of your favorite lifts and uh, some things you feel really strong at? Man, it just depends on whatever my favorite is at the time. Right now, I'm really liking front squats, uh, Larson press, uh, seal rows, upright rows, uh, hack squats, just big, basic compound movements. Um, some of my best sets for those exercises um in terms of larson press i've done 370 pause for one rep this was about five months ago i'm sure i could do more now but i haven't tested it in a while um i've done 225 on front squats for a set of 20 just a few hours ago i did 250 for a set of 16 i'm looking to get 
uh, the, the whole 20 piece next week. My goal for this year is 315 for 20, which I'm sure I'm going to get. Uh, I really like super high rep sets on hack squats. I learned that from Dan Green. He used to do sets of 30 all the time, and we're like a similar height. He's a very hip dominant lifter, just like me. And he used hack squats to get his legs bigger so he wouldn't have to rely on a strong ass back. Uh, seal rows, I have done 315 for one. Um, shit. Uh, two, 205 for like 15 reps with a cambric bar on seal rows. Pull ups, I'm really good at as well. I've done four plates for one rep max on pull ups, four plates for two reps on chin ups. I could list it on and on, but I, I try to be well-rounded overall, I guess is the point. I try a bunch of different movements and my, my goal is to always maximize my performance, not only in like a one rep max capacity, but in like my rep strength capacity. So I do like sets of eight. I go for rep maxes as well. So you mentioned something that I want to um, circle back to that's um, Dan green uh, and uh, doing hack squats. Like, one of the things, uh, you know, I try to teach folks is to, you know, don't just do your squats, do some other things, you know, get your quads back, you, you know, do good, get, do your quad, get your quads big on other things other than squats. Um, you know, what is your philosophy on exercise variety? Are you a guy that just likes minimal type of training or do you like to go uh, broad with several different, you know, big guns? I think I would say I'm more the, the latter type, so the, the broader big guns type of approach. I really got that from Dan Green. He's a lifter that I seriously look up to in terms of the way that he approaches training. And just overall, he has no weaknesses. Like He does deficit stiff leg deadlifts with a ton of weight. He does front squats with a ton of weight. He used to bench press a lot back in the day. I really like looking at exercises categorically and then trying to – fit as many boxes as I can within my training economy. So like, for example, I like having a movement in my program where I can push my quads to failure in absence of like my lower back limiting me. I like to have something in that, like that year round. That's really valuable in my opinion for people who like Dan Green and myself are very hip dominant with their lifting, meaning you use your lower back a lot. Just because if you do that, not to say that you won't get big legs if you squat primarily like that, but your quads can always be bigger if you emphasize them. So in terms of that versus training minimalism, I don't think that you should include a million different things and rotate them all the time just because you feel like it. But you should have, like I said, categorically exercises in your program. And the least amount that you need to fit in those categories is the amount that you should have in my opinion. No, I, you know, I don't like, um, I don't like over exercise variety, but mm -hmm. you know, one exercise per body part is not a, a broad enough base, uh, you know, for quality strength and quality muscle. You need to kind of, a, and this isn't like some bro sciencey thing where you need to attack it from different angles and all that kind of stuff. And there, there can be, you know, underneath that there's some validity, but it's more about, you know, when you attack a muscle group with multiple big lifts, you know, you're really strength, you're, you're strengthening it. You're, you're covering all your bases. You have a broader shot group, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And when your base is broader, that allows you to peak so much higher. In, yes, in I wanna, I, 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 sorry. I want to talk about strength a little bit. Um, do you have a love for like initially when you started lifting, did you have a love for strength and how is your love for strength now? Because sometimes when guys start lifting, they start doing, a, they want to build muscle They're you know, they're doing the progressive overload thing. And all of a sudden they end up at the, at the end of the tunnel, you know, strong as fuck. And their love for strength is almost more than their love for muscle. Where do you fall on that spectrum? I really love, training my body in general um strength to me is just a way of being able to track my progress i also train for hypertrophy but 
I really would say that that is a means to acquire strength, in my opinion. Like, it's a necessary part of it. You have to get more jacked to get stronger to an extent. Like, a bigger muscle is going to be a, a stronger one if you train it to be strong. Um, now, in terms of how I, I view strength, do I love it? Absolutely. But I also love just the act of getting in the gym and training my body and developing discipline and, you know, everything that comes into training that's more – not to use a hokey pokey word, but spiritual, like the right. marrying the spiritual and the physical side of things and just really enjoying doing what I'm doing. You know, there is like, you can't, you know, the piece no one really talks about is like you, you can't get anywhere if you don't really love it, you know, and if you're not in love with what you're doing, you know, you can fake it. There's not, it's not like that every day, man. We all have days where we're like grind on, you know, you're just grinding on, but at the end of the day, you know, if you don't love this with a, with a crazy passion, there's, there's just, you're not going to get the most out of it. Absolutely. And just to talk about the falling out of love with it portion, because people are going to invariably do this training shit for every, for, for a few years, and then they're going to feel disillusioned with it. What I'll say is, is that like, you have to center yourself and your why, like, why are you doing this? If you're doing it for no reason, Maybe training isn't for you. Maybe this was just a season in your life and that season's over. But I think that to avoid that, you should always be reminding yourself why you're doing things and, you know, modifying your reason for doing things over time. For me, I really like being someone that speaks with conviction. When I make promises, I keep them. And training is almost a way to express the discipline that you need to be that kind of person because you have to get up. You schedule your program to be this way. You have this progression, this progression, this progression week to week, and you're going to get in the gym and you're going to make your best effort to get in there and do that. And that just has helped me translate that laterally into other areas of my life as well. Yeah, man. I mean, if you can't be a man of your word to yourself, you know, to yourself, um, how can you be, how can you start to possibly be a man of your word to other people? You know, that's the way I look at it. Like I have my dreams and my goals and am I going to get up every day and lie to myself and pretend I want these things? Or am I going to be, you know, a man of my word to myself and I'm going to stick to this and create some discipline and some structure to get there? Because either, you know, if you want to, for me, if like I take being a good person seriously, whatever that means to me, it's not going to mean the same thing to you, but it all starts with when I wake up and I did something I shouldn't have done yesterday, you know, it's like, I got to be a man of my word to myself. A lot of times people see me on social media and like, you're a dick. <laughs> you can be kind of a dick sometimes or kind of straightforward, but all of those thoughts are internalized like things i'm saying to myself like hey fat ass you shouldn't have ate the pizza last night right <laughs> right so um you know do you have that internal monologue you know that you're continually processing what you did how to refine it that sort of thing absolutely so just like you i'm very introspective and anything that i ask of someone i'm asking that same thing of myself and i always try to the best of my ability to carry out to doing what I know I need to, to acquire the results that I'm looking for. So, you know, if I want to make a certain amount of money per year, I have to do X, Y, and Z to acquire that. If you want to have a good relationship with your, your wife or your boyfriend or whatever the case may be, who, whoever's watching, you can insert yourself in that. You have to make sure that you're doing certain things. There's due diligence in relationships. There's due diligence in the gym. You got to get your ass in there. You got to train. You got to give things effort, intensity, and just accept the good with the bad. So sometimes you're going to do everything right and you're going to have a shit session. And sometimes you can get away with not doing what you're supposed to and have a good session, but you should never pay too much attention to the highs and the lows and just look at what your trend is overall. If you are on average doing what you're supposed to, you have all your non training related factors in line you're going to be someone that gets more jacked and stronger over time is what it is. I want to talk a little bit um, about, you know, fitness myths and which ones uh, 
do any of them bother you more than others? Like, for example, I think the one over the years, uh, and you're a great example of this, one over the years that I wouldn't say bothers me, but I just get tired of is like the concept that you can somehow get big if you don't get a lot stronger than you were at the starting point. Are there anything like any of these types of myths or beliefs that, uh, you know, bother you more than others? That is a big one. So I'm making a video basically talking about where you can't separate performance from hypertrophy. You can do a lot of things to acquire hypertrophy, but at some point you're going to have to put more weight on the bar. It's just the fact. Um, another one that really bothers me, and this is just like more so like a overall category of shit that bothers me, but like X exercise is dangerous or X exercise is killing your gains. And then they give like these contrived, you know, basically anecdotal reasons for why, for example, upright rows are terrible for your shoulders or squats are terrible for your knees or whatever is terrible for whatever. And it's never really founded in any sort of like, you know, practical experience. It's a fact that you can, as a you know, the human body can adapt to like load and positions that you put it into over time, as long as you load it intelligently. They miss the forest for the trees with those nocebos is what they're called. They don't talk about how you can use less loads. So like, for example, with an upright row, you're doing this. If you can do this with no weight, you can add two pounds and do that, and it still won't hurt. Now, if you throw on a fuck ton of weight and then you try to do it, yeah, there's a possibility that you can hurt yourself. But just like with everything, you have to take the personal accountability to do things smartly and listen to your body. And not, and this is the fault of social media, in my opinion, but not try to keep up with the Joneses, you know. <clears throat> do what's appropriate for you. You mentioned this is why uh, upright rows are actually why I asked you this question because like there are certain exercises you knew not, you know how it goes when you when you hear the exercise mentioned you just know twenty five percent of those watching is like their balls are shrinking up into their their torso because <laughs> like oh man he did leg extensions or upright rows or um, you know like Athlean X was talking about we're not going to bash Athlean X but he was talking about how I got two hernias from doing dumbbell rows like. People develop these fears of exercises and um, exercises I've done for years. And that that's just anecdotal evidence, right? I haven't gotten injured. But, um, you know, some of them have become picked up such a religious level of hype that people think if they do upright rows, they're going to, you know, they're going to shit out their intestines or something <laughs> ridiculous, right? <laughs> It's upright rows, incline bench is another one where I think the, the guy's name was Ryan Crowley where he tore his pec doing a incline bench press with Larry Wheels. It wasn't that because of his incline benching that he tore his pec. He tore his pec because he was going through a rage of motion he wasn't accustomed to with right. way too much fucking weight. And that's like that's always the reason why you get injured. You just were not accustomed to the, the range of motion that you're going through with the load that you're using it, or you were under recovered or both to be honest with you it's never the exercise's fault it, you had to have given, given the input for the that result to come out incline bench didn't come to you and bust down your door and then snap your pec you did that so let me ask you this and i've never asked anyone this question before it just came to mind but i'm curious what you think like in your lifting career you're going to pick up random minor strains and tweaks and little niggles and all kinds of stuff it's kind of part of the journey right but um how many of those do you what percentage do you think is just pure random just like uh, just random just you know like uh your training and something's just a little bit off that day like just pure random i would say um, I, I, no, I'll hold off on saying my percentage guess. I, I'll, what percentage of all these little minor strains and pains and niggles and tweaks that you've experienced over the years, would you say at random or just from poor training? That's kind of the, the, the funny story that we could tell. So, you know, the major injuries, a lot of the time you saw them coming or should have saw them coming weeks ago. But to be honest with you, with training or with any physical endeavor, so you could be playing a sport or something. Sometimes you're going to hurt or things are going to hurt and there's like 
no good reason for it. And a lot of times they'll go away on their own in my experience. I would say of like, you know, the tweaks and injuries and niggles and things, I think it'd be hard to put a percentage to it. But most of the time, like I said, when they do happen, they're just there for no reason and they resolve themselves. I think that that's scary for people that don't know what like a niggle feels like and what an actual injury feels like. And I think that's where a lot of the nocebo stuff can start to make sense to people like that. Yeah, there's a lot of information out there, man, that's programming people to like be hypersensitive to minor uh, injuries. Like we have uh, muscles, connective tissue, um, joints. We got all kinds of things and they're strengthening at different levels. And some sometimes they're just weaker on a day, you know, for no reason at all. And uh, I would say a good portion of just the minor uh, strains and pains and things just, you know, just part of the process. But do you do you agree or what are your thoughts on um, there's a lot of information out there that just makes people hyper focused on uh, the downsides of lifting, you know, injuries and and, uh, you know, making them think they got to do all this prehab and rehab and foam rolling and uh, extreme, just all this kind of stuff. And that somehow it'll make all these little aches and pains go away. That. I mean, I empathize with people who think that way because ultimately many people that train, they're training to feel more healthy and to be better humans. But the where they're missing the plot is that if you follow a well-structured program where overall you're getting stronger and bigger, a more resilient muscle comes from one that's just stronger overall. Now, in terms of people including things like movement prep into their programs, I do think that that's appropriate, but you have to have that just be like the 5% of your program. Most of your program should be filled with things that are there to get you stronger and bigger. And then you have just enough to be responsible in terms of movement prep to make sure that you minimize your injury risks. Like for me, for example, what I like doing if I have a pressing workout is I don't do a million and one fucking exercises to work up to warm up with. I get some light dumbbells and I'd rep out like 20 reps, a couple sets of 20 maybe. And then I do some light dumbbell rows. Then my pec is ready. And then my shoulder is ready because I did the rows to start benching heavy. And that's my movement prep. I'm not doing a cat cow stretch and getting under a foam roller and hitting myself with the massage gun. I'm no, I'm doing some simple shit and then I'm getting to work. I think most people should do that. Now, obviously listen to your body, but keep it simple. Yeah, I'm not trying to dissuade. I don't want anybody to under, misunderstand me. I'm not trying to dissuade people from doing that stuff. But, like, there are a lot of sites out there that program you with fear to believe if you don't do all this elaborate stuff or if you do do all this elaborate stuff that somehow it's going to make the path any easier. But you're, you're going to still pick up strains and pains and injuries. And what I've found uh, being a lifter that's lifted for nearly 40 years is that while you might walk around with these little things, and they might become part of your life, right? At the end of the day, you are so strong. Uh, your joints and your tendons and your connective tissue and your muscle that you avoid more of the major injuries and major conditions that the average person has to deal with. So you might walk around with a little bit of this or that, but during your journey, you're going to be like, you know, much more better equipped to handle life much more resilient, much more conditioned, stronger. Now, just to speak about the little niggles that you'll pick up over time, you can wake up, you can do all the like the warm ups and movement prep and prehabbing that you want. You can wake up and wake up with a crick in your neck for no reason. Right. And then suddenly all that movement prep was for nothing to those people. So just I think for anyone that can relate or resonate with this conversation, just understand that you know, just accept a certain level of not injury, but pain or tweaks. It's just a part of the game and it's not the end of the world to happen. So I want to talk to you. I got a couple more things I want to talk to you before I let you go. And I appreciate you joining me. Um, Obesity, you know, there's a ton of guys that want to be like you. Um, and we both been there, man. I was 346 and, you know, you were close to the 300 range, wherever you're at. But um, there's a lot of downsides to that, obviously. But, 
you know, what do you have to say to the younger guys that want to be like you that are 300? Where's the best place to start? Uh, I have a buddy. His name is on social media, Stan Strength, and his brand is called uh, Stan Strength, and it's based around the phrase, start where you stand, right? So wherever you're at, that's where you have to progress from. I'm really big on compartmentalizing your tasks in terms of, you know, you the task at hand is for you to lose 10 pounds. Okay, once you complete that, then the task at hand is for you to lose another 10 and then another and then so on. Once you're in a place where, you know, you can build muscle and not be in a place where if you're in a surplus, you're just going to get fat again. That's when you can start to think about, okay, now that I've lost all this weight after maybe two or three years, I'm going to start, you know, strength training more seriously or doing translating from doing this to doing that. You have to break things up into sizable bites, because if you look at the whole bigger picture, if you're trying in the course of a year to lose 100 pounds and get a 315 bench press and a 500 deadlift and have a Christmas tree on your back like I do, you're going to set yourself up for failure more than likely, even if you use like performance enhancing drugs. It's just the truth of it. Yeah, I mean, one thing I teach or I try to teach is focus on what you can control. Like, um, you know, you you got to take the next step. You got to you ain't you're not going to get to the end zone if you don't first take the first necessary step you need to take. And um, you know, it's it's a hard like if I grew up in the world you grew up in, and I'm not trying to play the old man card here, but <laughs> like I grew up in a world where there was no cable TV and no real video games and no convenience stores. And, you know, we had a, we didn't have a lot of that stuff. So it was a lot easier to focus. And if I grew up in the world you grew up in, man, I would have been a hot mess. I just would have. I know I would have because I would have had all these distractions around but how much of this um, would you say is pulling the distractions away, keeping the food out of the house, um, you know, trying to keep some sort of reasonable sleep schedule instead of playing video games all night? How much of this uh, comes down to um, removing some of the distractions? That's the first step that I feel a lot of people need to take in this day and age, because to your point, and I appreciate you for like saying that it, it would have been a different experience for you if you had the same options that we did. So I appreciate that. Um, Cause a lot of, you know, elders in the gym, they'll, they'll say like, Oh, we were just so much better than you. And it doesn't matter right, that, right. you know, and it's not being realistic, but for a lot of people, it's, you know, unplugging their PlayStation and honestly putting it away not having cinnamon toast crunch in the house, not staying up watching Netflix until two in the morning, doing their homework earlier so that they're not up late as fuck at night and they can get quality sleep, eating vegetables with every meal. It starts with removing some of your choices, quite honestly, because if you have a million and different things that you can choose from, you're always going to pick from the options that one are the quickest, two are the dirtiest, and three are often like, not good for you and they're, they're tasty or they're instant gratification. If you remove those options away from you, you're going to have no choice but to eat vegetables, meat and potatoes, get eight hours of sleep, drink water instead of soda. You see? Now I'm going to ask you the question that everybody wants to know. The most important question of all, uh, what type of training split or programming do you enjoy the most? Oh, my, my first love was full body. Um, I do upper lowers now, but the way I structure them these days is that I don't fit four training sessions. So I have an upper lower, upper lower. I used to fit it in a week, but I'm just at a point now where like with the volumes that I have to do and the weights that I'm using, I spread it out among like nine days. So it'll go upper, lower, rest, upper, rest, lower, rest, rest. So that's eight. So it'll be sometimes it'd be in an eight day split. Sometimes it'll be a nine because I'll put an extra rest day in there. I really enjoy doing that because it allows you one to, you know, have two times muscle protein synthesis. You work a bench two times a week and then a squat or something two times a week. 
but it allows focus to both the upper and lower body instead of trying to fit everything in one session like a, a full body would. And that was kind of why I moved away from doing it that way myself. I really enjoy that. Yeah, I'm kind of glad you don't say staple to, uh, you know, everything has to be according to a week. Most of my clients and, uh, you know, I try to get them out of the week, you know, think like everything has to, this has to be on Monday, that has to be on Tuesday, a little bit more flexibility. And uh, I imagine, you know, if you need to work in a rest day or cut a rest day here and there, you do so, um, you know, probably rarely, but if you need to, you have the flexibility because you're not like, I'm trapped in that weak paradigm. Um, now, I want to, last thing I want to ask you about is uh, where you're heading because you, you know, I've, I've been through the, the paces and I've made my own mistakes. But you sit at the beginning of a career, you're a young guy, um, you know, and you, you're watching your YouTube grow and it can go like, boom, I'm just commenting on someone's YouTube to boom, all of a sudden I got a career, uh, right? Um, what, what are you looking forward to? What, what, what are you trying to achieve right now? You know, how do you view this, you know, moving forward as a career? What are your goals? What do you want to get out of it? How do you want to grow? That's an interesting question. I'm not really somebody that thinks or lives in the future too much. Now, obviously, I make sure I do certain things so that I could sustainably keep doing what I'm doing. But really, my goal is to just continue to help younger guys and give them perspective and show them a good example of how to be and how to train and uh, put out a positive message to people. I don't want to like shell out to supplement companies. I'm not going to do that no matter what the money looks like. I've seen the downfall of where that could take someone, not only like in terms of their branding, but also their personality totally changes when they become beholden to these fucking larger entities. Right. Um, that being said, I have no problem picking up sponsorships with like, you know, weight training stuff that I use, but even then it would be something like, Hey, Here's what I use. I think it's cool. Maybe you think it's cool too. So you just hooked up with Bells of Steel, correct? Absolutely. Wonderful company. Yeah. Uh, the only reason I mention it is because um, I'm launching an app on the uh, 16th and they're doing a giveaway. So I've been, I'm connecting with them as well, trying to have a relationship going forward. And uh, I, I thought I saw that on your social media. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. I, that was a, uh, a big W for me, I would say, just because, like I said, I've been using their stuff for many years now. The first thing I bought from them was uh, their belt squat belt. That was a few years ago. Really enjoy all their products. What they just uh, gave me was their reverse hammer. It's like a reverse hyper and a GHD right. combined into one. And I've been abusing that since I got it. So, so um, what did you do during the pandemic when that hit? Um, do you like wake up? Were you gymless or uh, what kind of position did that put you in? I'm one of those people that over prepares for when things like that could happen. So I already had like home gym equipment, to be honest with you. So uh, I would say, quite frankly, that I got better gains when the gym was closed because I was just in my home gym. I just had a squat rack, a bench, uh, pull up bar and weight plates and a GHD. So I was refined to the basics of the basics. I didn't have a bunch of shit going on around me. I had my room and I had my weights. So I trained. Uh, that, that wasn't many people's reality, unfortunately, but I made better gains during like the lockdowns, quite honestly. So last question, I'll let you go. And I appreciate you uh, taking an hour to, to do this. You have any exercises you really like that other people would think you're nuts for using? <laughs> Um, so at first one of them was definitely seal rows until just eventually people started doing them cause I was doing them. Um, I don't tend to do anything that's too crazy. I mean, people, I do upright rows, people, Hey doggo. Sorry. Dog. I love dogs. Dog. Um, upright rows are probably one that if I do them and you think they're dangerous, they, they might raise an eyebrow, but yeah, I thought I'd toss out that question because, um, I got to be honest, I'll admit something I've never admitted in, in, in a long time. And I'll admit it here on this podcast. I used to think dumbbell kickbacks were the worst exercise in the history of the world. 
and then I uh, started doing them rest pause, you know, for higher reps. I'm like, man, this this isn't a bad finisher. Maybe I got to rethink uh, think my biases a little bit. So, man, I really appreciate you joining me. I'll let you go. It's been an hour. Um, folks watching on YouTube, you can check out uh, the podcast as well. I'm going to be linking that below to Spotify, iTunes, and all that kind of good stuff. So tell us again, uh, Paris, where we can find you. Bald Omni Man on YouTube and Bald Omni Man on Instagram. All right, man. Thanks again. And I'll talk to you soon. We are out of here. Talk to you.